Hi, I'm Dr. Steve Klein from the Department of Communication at the University of Missouri. This is the latest in a series of online video lessons intended to provide you important principles and helpful concepts for the study of communication. This video is intended to be an introduction to intercultural communication. Now, intercultural communication is a vast and multifaceted and complex subfield in the area of communication studies, and one video is just not going to be able to be comprehensive and do the field justice. So I'm not going to try to do that. Instead, what I want to do is to provide some fundamental concepts to give you a sense of some of the most important issues that one faces when engaging intercultural communication. And not just from the standpoint of scholarship, but importantly, from the standpoint of those of us who want to try to improve the effectiveness and the ethical nature of the communication that we engage in whenever we encounter folks from another cultural standpoint. Now, in order to understand intercultural communication, we need to have a good sense of what we mean by culture. And in a previous video in this series, we took a look at what culture means and the distinction between understanding culture and understanding society as different ways of thinking about group identity. Simply put, culture is the ongoing negotiation of learned and patterned beliefs, attitudes, values, and behaviors. Sometimes when we think about culture, we often consider it to be a relatively narrow thing that has to do with a nationality or an ethnic background. But culture really is something that's more broad and more important than that. We're not just talking about nationalities and ethnicities, but we're talking about everything from race to regional identities to gender and sexuality, uh, ability and disability, socioeconomic class, religion. What all of these group identities have in common is that over the course of history, as passed down in a communicative and educational process, passing down beliefs, attitudes, values, the norms and rules of how one ought to think of themselves and how one ought to think of the world and other people and how to act on those norms. And culture is something that is passed down from generation to generation and provides a, not a monolithic and unchanging sense of who one is as a member of a group, but it's something that is embedded in our lives from the time that we're born until the time that we pass on. It's something that predates us and chances are is going to outlive us. And so when we think about culture and the ways in which it has a profound impact on how we look at ourselves and how we look at the world, you can imagine that when we get into intercultural communication, and here comes the easiest definition in the video, communication between people with differing cultural identities, you can imagine that intercultural communication is going to be something that is potentially fraught with miscommunication. Because when you've got two people or two groups and each of those persons or groups has been embedded in a complex matrix learned from the time that they're born and something that has been passed throughout history and throughout generations regarding history and philosophy and the norms for how we look at ourselves and other people, rules and norms for how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to treat other people in different situations. This is something that is occasionally going to be really problematic to find common ground if we're not trying to find that common ground. And so two really common and linked potential challenges to intercultural communication really need to be thought about intentionally if we want to try to improve our intercultural communication skills. The first is what's referred to as an other-focused orientation. Often when we communicate with somebody from a different cultural standpoint, we immediately, and to some extent this is natural, right? We take the position that ours is the norm. The way in which I think, I act, I look at the world on the day-to-day, -day, that's something that I take for granted as the way things are. And so when I encounter somebody that brings difference to this encounter, I think about them as the other. I am going to judge them and evaluate what they're doing as something that is somehow different from the norm, the default, if you will, that I embody in myself. And of course, the problem there is, is it automatically establishes that the person with whom you are engaged is somehow 
off the norm, somehow different from what is supposed to be, rather than having a cultural standpoint that is just as justified and just as normal to that person as our cultural standpoint is to us. So an other focused orientation establishes a power dynamic between the two of us that is going to make it really difficult to mutually understand and treat each other with the kind of respect that we need. Now, of course, taken to its logical conclusion, an other-focused orientation may in fact result in ethnocentrism, our tendency to view our own culture as superior to other cultures. When we find ourselves in a situation when we're dealing with someone from a different cultural standpoint than the one that we're used to, we feel uncomfortable because we are not able to expect and anticipate all of those things that we take for granted when we're engaged in communication with someone who is in the same cultural framework that we are, right? So one of the things that we often do to defend ourselves against that kind of discomfort, that kind of anxiety in some cases, is to look at the things that are easiest and most comfortable for us as better than those others because, well, I don't feel any anxiety or discomfort when I look at things from the point of view that I'm familiar with. And cultures and the ideologies that they construct have a tendency to inculcate a sense of comfort and indeed pride in the kind of cultural identity that we have. So ethnocentrism is... And this is not at all to justify necessarily maintaining an ethnocentric standpoint. It's only to recognize that ethnocentrism is something that is very common. And though it's problematic, it comes from a place that's relatively easy to understand. Now, that being said, we do not want to be satisfied with resting on an other focused ethnocentric standpoint when communicating with those from other cultural perspectives. The goal that we have, rather, is what a lot of scholars in this area refer to as intercultural communication competence, ICC for short. Intercultural communication competence, essentially, is the ability to communicate effectively and appropriately in various cultural contexts. And indeed, in a 21st century international political economy and information society, where the boundaries between nations are becoming more porous than ever, in a whole host of professional careers and public activities, interacting with those from other cultural standpoints is something that is increasingly impossible to avoid. And this is especially true when you consider that we're not just talking about international or inter-ethnic communication difference when we're talking about intercultural communication. We're talking about communication between peoples of different races or religions or regional identities, gender and sexual orientations, and so forth. So intercultural communication competence involves being aware of and consciously working on understanding those principles that enable us to see where another culture is coming from, rather than just automatically default it as, well, that's different than us. And so there's some important ideas we want to think about as we approach this idea. The first, and one of the easiest to start getting a handle on, comes from anthropologist Edward T. Hall, who came up with the idea of context as a way of understanding cultural communication in his book, The Silent Language, in 1959. When we think about context and culture from Hall's standpoint, he's envisioning thinking about cultures on a continuum between low-context cultures and high-context cultures. On the one hand, in a low-context culture, much of the meaning generated within an interaction comes from the verbal communication that's used. So, if you live in the United States, for instance, and you identify yourself as part of U.S. culture, you live in a low-context culture. And we often describe this kind of communication as saying what we mean and meaning what we say. When we use such cliches as getting straight to the point or avoiding beating around the bush, the idea is we place a premium on the clarity of using words in ways that we mean as literally as possible. And so we get rather confused and sometimes offended when we encounter folks from other cultures that understand communication from a high context perspective. A high context culture is one in which much of the meaning comes from nonverbal and contextual cues. 
In other words, we can say things using language, using words, but a lot of how we understand what those words mean are not going to come from the words themselves, but they're going to come from other kinds of assumptions that somebody within the cultural framework is going to understand. Everything from facial expression and body language to the way that we say things in certain environmental settings as opposed to other environmental settings. And so we can't necessarily take for granted that what somebody explicitly says word wise is necessarily everything that they mean now we want to make sure that we're being clear that being low context and being high context is not to be read as being clear as opposed to not being clear because someone that's coming from a high context culture is going to understand that the verbal, nonverbal, and contextual cues in the communication that are put together in certain ways are going to be exceedingly clear for the people that exist in those cultures. And then somebody coming in from a low context culture that can't understand and is unable to read the nonverbal and contextual cues, well, that person really isn't all that competent as a communicator from the standpoint of these cultural norms. So let's take this idea of low context and high context cultures and bring to it another set of ideas that were developed in the middle part of the 20th century that have come to really define a lot of the state of the art and how we understand specific communication tendencies from cultures. And these ideas, these dimensions of cultural communication, come from Geert Hofstede, who actually did much of his work as a personal researcher for the IBM Corporation when he was trying to engage in research in order to understand how can we best communicate with one another uh, as an international, uh, multinational corporation with offices all around the world when we have people that communicate from very different cultural standards. Standpoints. So, in his 1980 book, Culture's Consequences, International Differences and Work-Related Values, Hofstede articulated six dimensions of culture, or rather, six dimensions of cultural difference, again, that we can understand in terms of continuums. Those dimensions are individualism versus collectivism, high power distance versus low power distance, masculinity versus femininity low tolerance for uncertainty and a desire to avoid it versus a higher tolerance and comfort with uncertainty, long-term orientation versus short-term orientation, and indulgence versus restraint. Let's take a look at each of these dimensions one at a time to see how they might account for different ways in which cultures are going to look at the world and subsequently the kinds of communication patterns they're going to prefer. From the standpoint of individualism versus collectivism, we're looking at a continuum that essentially puts into tension the individual isolated person versus the community. So a culture that privileges individualism values independence. In an individualist culture, individual choices and decisions are expected, and those are the most important things to do. Asserting yourself as an individual, as someone with autonomy and free choice is absolutely important. As opposed to a collectivist culture where interdependence is much more important. Folks in a collectivist culture see themselves not as much as individuals as they are members of larger wholes. I am a member of a family. I am a member of a community. I am an employee of a company. I am a resident of a province or a nation. And I think about my relationship to the rest of the group as something that's on balance more important than my own autonomous identity. So if you take a look at the world map that uh, Hofstede and his uh, associates have done in their studies, you can see that the lighter colored nations on the map are going to be nations that are more collectivist as opposed to the darker colored nations on the map that are going to be more individualist. And it should come as no surprise to anyone familiar with U.S. culture that the United States is a far more individualist culture than most nations in the world. Uh, particularly when you think about more collectivist cultures in places like East Asia. Besides collectivism and individualism, another real important continuum in these dimensions of culture has to do with power distance. 
When you're dealing with a low power distance culture, and the United States is another example of this, we have a preference for equality of status and power between uh, the members of various institutions. When you think about family members, when you think about people that work together in a workplace, when you think about leadership of a state or a nation as opposed to the citizens who may be responsible for putting that leader into power. In a low power distance culture, we really place a premium on the fact that no one is in a position of power or authority that makes it impossible for the rest of us uh, to have equal fair status. Now, by contrast, in a high power distance culture, this kind of culture expects and accepts unequal power between superiors and subordinates. If you are a member of a family, those who are older, your parents, your elders, they are going to be in a superior power relationship relative to you as a younger member of that family, and that's something that you accept without question. And the same kind of acceptance of power distance in things like the workplace and in the political structure of the nation is something that people in a high power distance culture are going to take for granted and indeed expect it. And those who are in a relatively subordinate position that somehow speak out and challenge the authority of those who are in an acceptably superior position, well, they're the ones that are being abnormal and problematic. And as you can imagine, again, if you're familiar with U.S. culture, the United States, as well as many other Western nations in Europe, see themselves as very low power distance, as opposed to many nations Again, we can look to South and East Asia, as well as many African nations, as much more high power distance cultures, where structures of authority and power between superiors and subordinates is something that's really taken for granted. There are some other dimensions of cultural difference that Hofstede talks about that we want to attend to. But before we do that, let's take an opportunity to try to understand how such things as low context versus high context culture, individualism versus collectivism, and low power distance versus high power distance might have a profound effect on an intercultural communication episode. What I want to do is share with you a brief clip from a 1993 film called The Joy Luck Club. The Joy Luck Club is about two generations of Chinese and Chinese American women. The mothers in this story all have emigrated from China to the United States at certain points in their lives and then had Chinese American daughters while they are living in the United States. And the stories talk about the tensions that exist between the Chinese American daughters who essentially were raised to embrace U.S. culture. Uh, struggling against the Chinese culture that really defines the lives of their parents, especially their mothers. And in the scene we're about to see, you're going to meet Waverly and her mother. Waverly is thinking about getting married to an Anglo-American fiancé and brings this fiancé, Rich, home to meet the family for the mother's birthday party and intercultural communication problems start cropping up once they hit the dinner table. The next week I brought Rich to mom's birthday dinner, sort of a surprise present. I figured she was going to have to accept Rich, like it or not. Ah, oh, Rich, this is my father. How are you doing? Happy birthday, How are you? Mom. I'm good, I'm good. And Ma, this is Rich. Great to meet you. Boy, something smells wonderful. I guess we came to the right place, huh? Here you are. You know, Waverly has been telling me that you are the best cook. I think maybe we got her. So many spots on his face. Of course, the knight was still young. Thank God I already prepped him on the Emily Post of Chinese manners. Actually, there were a few things I forgot to mention. Uh, let me make a toast. He shouldn't have had that second glass. 
when everyone else had had only half an inch just for taste. Shrimp. My favorite. He should have taken only a small spoonful of the best dish until everyone had had a helping. He has good appetite. He shouldn't have bragged he was a fast learner. But the worst was when Rich criticized my mother's cooking, and he didn't even know what he had done. As is the Chinese cook's custom, my mother always insults her own cooking. But only with the dishes she serves with special pride. This dish not salty enough. No flavor. It's too bad to eat. But please. <laughs> oh. That was our cue to eat some. And proclaim it the best she'd ever made. You know, Linda. All this needs is a little soy sauce. Oh. 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 So, how'd your mom react when you told her about the wedding? It never came up. How come? She'd rather get rectal cancer. As you can probably gather from that cringeworthy episode we just saw, not only did Rich have a difficult time connecting with the traditional Chinese culture of Waverly's mother, but he also was rather clueless about it in a way that really speaks to the cultural differences between somebody who grew up very firmly in a U.S. cultural standpoint as opposed to someone who came of age and practices a traditional Chinese cultural standpoint. Rich is looking out for himself, not only in making sure that he is able to enjoy the things that he wants to enjoy in the meal, but also in taking a very active role in communicating with the family, trying to essentially establish himself as a very strong and charismatic figure. And so there's a lot of emphasis on Rich's individualism that really seems to ignore the importance of respecting the collective around that Chinese dinner table, sharing things, making sure that everybody has something before having some extra, for instance. We can also see that Rich particularly struggles with the difference between a low context and a high context culture. Rich is assuming that when people say things, they mean exactly what they say. But the traditional Chinese sitting around that dinner table know full well that when mom says certain things and does certain things during the ritual behaviors that take place at a traditional family dinner, that they don't necessarily always mean what the words themselves say. You have to take it in the context of the larger ritual of the family dinner. And Rich doesn't understand that, and he really screws up as a consequence. And finally, in that very last moment where he expresses some confusion to Waverly as to why Waverly didn't bring up the fact that they were going to get married, he doesn't understand that Waverly is really struggling with a high power distance norm in the family. It is absolutely important to Waverly that her parents, and in particular her mother, approve of Rich before moving forward with something as monumental as a wedding. She can't even possibly think about making that kind of announcement without first having the approval of mother. Whereas as far as Rich is concerned, they're two grown adults, they're going to get married, and it really doesn't make any difference if mom or dad approve or not. And so he didn't really understand that Waverly was simply not in a position to be able to make that announcement. And of course, this isn't to say that he had a problem with Waverly's position. He was just confused because he missed all of the important nonverbal and contextual cues that went down in that dinner. He thought everything went well, whereas Waverly knew that Rich made a very poor impression during that dinner. Besides the cultural continuum between individualist and collectivist cultures and between low power distance and high power distance cultures, 
Hofstede's 6D model of national culture has four additional continua with dimensions that focus on a wide variety of possible cultural differences that those who want to engage in effective cross-cultural communication really need to consider. What we've talked about so far, however, gives us a good introductory sense of some of the most important issues facing those who want to be competent in intercultural communication. Now, what's the point of understanding low versus high context cultures and understanding the continuum of these six dimensions of culture? Well, remember that the more we understand about other cultures, the greater opportunity we have to reach that ideal goal of intercultural communication competence. We're going to be in a better position to be able to communicate effectively and appropriately in various cultural contexts if we have some kind of understanding going into those encounters, first of all, that folks are going to have cultural orientations that can be very different from ours, and even better, if we have a sense of what some of those alternate cultural standpoints might be, we have a better shot at being able to appreciate them on their merits rather than automatically default to an other-centered orientation or rest in the comfort of problematic ethnocentrism. If you've got questions about this or any of the other videos in this series, please don't hesitate to let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.